good evening, and welcome to Community Issues. I'm your host, Patty Frew, and the telephone number to call if you would like to talk to us here on Community Issues is 332-5466. Tonight we have a most unique show for you, a show that I think touches all of us, and a show that I hope that you'll enjoy, and I hope that you'll give us a little bit of input into. My guest tonight is uh, Bill Reeve from Stratford County Hospice. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Patty. Um, you've been on the yes. show a little bit here. It's, we're here this week. I think people are tired of me in Rochester. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't think that they will. What is hospice? I think, Patty, the hospice, first and foremost, is a philosophy. It's not just a place or it's not just a service, but it's a philosophy of care for people who have terminal or life-threatening illnesses in advanced stages. And it's not just for the, for the patient, but it's also for the patient and the family. Um, I say it's a philosophy because it started out as a reaction to the kind of care that dying patients were receiving in the 1960s. Um, people were seeing that um, people typically with cancer, because cancer was, was the big terminal illness um, that uh, medical science hasn't been that successful with, um, people with cancer were dying in hospitals dying alone, um, feeling isolated, and no one really talking with them about that. Uh, a physician named Cicely Saunders recognized that and revived the hospice philosophy, which was originally um, put forth back in the Middle Ages, where hospices were special places for people to come to be refreshed, to be fed, to be cared for, and it was especially for those who were on life's last journey, those people who were going to be seeing God. So hospice had a philosophy that when curing was no longer possible, caring still was. And so that was the emphasis on, on taking care of people. But it's my understanding that you also work with people who are dealing with an illness, uh, let's say cancer, uh, women who have had mastectomies, hysterectomies. You have a program called Learning to Cope. Do you necessarily deal with people who are terminal? Uh, more and more we have been seeing people who don't have the, the classic six months or less to live. Um, I think a lot of people have uh, resisted hospice because they thought that, that accepting hospice was an automatic death sentence, and then you're going to give up and die. And uh, I don't think that hospice is like that at all. I think that hospice really can mean hope. And perhaps there's not a hope for, the, for a cure, but there's hope for leading as full a life as possible whatever time is, is left. We, we all are time limited. There's, there's a clock that's running out for each and every one of us. Um, and people who have a terminal or life-threatening illness are, are perhaps um, lucky in a sense that they have a better idea of when that clock is going to be running out for them and they can take care of some of the things that they need to take care of. You have many hospice facilities throughout the state. I wonder if you can tell us how many hospice workers there are and how many people you touch. Mm. Throughout the state, it's a little bit difficult to give you accurate um, statistics on number of people working. I can tell you that there are 27 hospice programs in the state of New Hampshire. Most of those are what we call community-based programs, like Stratford Hospice Care. They offer the volunteer component. And I say the volunteer component because that's just one aspect of the total hospice uh, range of care. Um, most, of, as I said, most of the programs are community-based. There are others that are uh, based out of visiting nurse associations or home health agencies, where they provide the nursing component and uh, home health aids and things of that nature, uh, physical therapy, occupational therapy. Then there are three programs that are based in hospitals: uh, one in Manchester and two in Nashua, where they have the inpatient uh, component of hospice care. Hospice care, as I said, is, is a philosophy. It's not just particularly a place. Um, so that in some places there are buildings that are hospices where there are nothing but hospice beds. Other places, hospice units are in, are in hospitals. Hospice care also goes on at home, and that's where our primary focus is. Um, we think that people, given the choice, would probably prefer to be at home, to be surrounded by the loved ones, to have their familiar surroundings, they have their cat on the bed, whatever. And that's what we try to do is support them in that, uh, give them the education that they may need about taking care of, of a patient at home, 
and then provide the volunteer support. Now, realistically, though, Bill, what does that do to the family, your hospice home care uh, or uh, your group in learning to cope? You don't just deal with these people as isolated individuals. No. You deal with that family unit. You are probably correct in saying that a majority of people who are suffering from terminal illness would rather be at home with dog, cat, and loved one. But doesn't that, doesn't that really rip the hearts of the family? Um, I think that's where hospice comes in to try to help that not happen um, by providing them with the kind of support that uh, lets them know what's going to be happening with, with the patient and, and what to expect that, and, and talking openly about what their fears are and, and what, what they're afraid might happen. That, um, I think that kind of thing prevents someone's heart being ripped out rather than not talking about it, not dealing with it, not knowing what to expect. You talked about people needing time to have the advantage in some cases to know that you're going to die in six months or a year to put things in order uh, before you die. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's true, the clock is running for all of us. What are the types of things that people do to prepare? Um, make Insurance, a will. Yeah. make a will. Make a will is, a lot of, is one of the major things that people do. Um, mostly, I think it's in terms of relationships. Um, maybe mending some fences that needed to be mended, uh, telling people what they haven't told someone, uh, both positive or negatively, uh, but usually more on the positive side, getting a chance to say that I love you or you know that you appreciated things that the person has done for you. Um, in, in some ways, we're not, we may not be talking about real, real earth-shaking um, kinds of events here, and, and it's true that, that we're not going to change the outcome um, of, of uh, the situation, but it's the quality of the time uh, that's important in, in our viewpoint and uh, having honest communication between family members and, and helping them uh, do take care of the things that they, that they need to is, is important. Hospice, whether you term it a theory uh, or a reality, it's something that is here and every day and needs to be dealt with. My guest is Bill Reed from Stratford County Hospice. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back. 332-5466 is the number to call. Since we're all going to die, um, and maybe some of you out there know what it is to deal with a terminal illness yourself, or maybe with a family member, we'd like you to give us a call here tonight and tell us about your experiences, if you would like to share them, or ask any questions, if you would like to uh, have Bill try to take a stab at answering them. Um, take a stab. Take a stab. Oh, oh. <laughs> that was very bad. <laughs> take a stab. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, all right. Why, why are we afraid of death? Because what, we don't know what happens afterwards. Uh, see, I'm not afraid to die myself, but I am afraid that people I love are going to die. And really, when you think about it, the person who dies really doesn't have much to deal with afterwards. Um, well, we don't know why are we so it. afraid? I really think it's, it's the, the fear of the unknown. It really, it's the big question. It's um, what happens afterwards. Are, are, are our beliefs really what happen? And I think that's, that plus, this is familiar and we, most of us have had a good time here on Earth. And, uh, but is it, it. is it that the two ways, um, seems to me I've heard people say that we die early because we are afraid to die ourselves. Yet I say I am not afraid to die and I really don't believe that I am afraid to die. But I do have a fear of someone I love. It, isn't that, that really mm -hmm. is a twofold. That you're sort of unusual, I think and you're not fearing it death doesn't, personally. Doesn't, I am not afraid to die a bit. Well, I, I think that also has to do with some of your, your own personal history and, and what you've had to deal with, too. But that's something else. Um, it's a, it seems to me a strange thing. We mourning um, people who die. Mm -hmm. um, that, that really is a consolement for us, and we fear that as well. Well, that's where we get to feel sorry for ourselves, basically. I think that, that mourning is for those who are left behind. I mean, we're not, can't feel too, too badly for the person who's no longer suffering. Um, I, 
I think everyone agrees that that you know they're better off probably wherever they are than than when they were dying. Um, it's for ourselves that we feel badly, and and that's appropriate. Um, in Ecclesiastes, there's, there's a time uh, to raise up and a, a time to tear down, a time to laugh and a time to cry, a time to mourn, and that's it's it's okay to mourn. Do people turn to religion? Do you see them? making that big turnaround. Uh, many of us have religious beliefs that we continue to deal with and follow through with mm -hmm. all of our lives. Mm -hmm. Some of us start out on the, that religious foundation, but we seem to lose it somewhere along the way. And some of us don't have any religious mm -hmm. foundation. But uh, it seems sometimes when people know that they are dying, they come to a realization of religion that they never had before. That, that does occur sometimes. I wouldn't say that's the majority cases. Um, what I think happens in the majority cases is that the the existing belief system just gets a little bit stronger. Um, most people have some religious background anyway, and uh, I think I have a tacit acceptance of that. It, there may be an increase in interest in it. I I personally haven't seen that many cases of, of real you know, 180 degree turnarounds, um, uh, that kind of thing. But I think that. Hospice is unusual in that it does accept the spiritual aspect as a valid and, and real part of all of this. And most human services don't want to get into religious or spiritual kinds of things. Um, we recognize that, that dealing with death is, is um, a spiritual issue also and try to bring in that aspect. What happens to someone who is dying and who wants to deal with it alone? Uh, someone who knows that they're going to die in six or eight months and would rather not stay with the family, would rather go away, but still needs a, a support unit like mm -hmm. hospice. Mm -hmm. Is it very well accepted? I would assume it would not be by the family, but um, is that, is that well, very I, good? Uh, the word to use is acceptance, and I think that's the key word in hospice. Hospice tries to accept patients and families in whatever they are feeling. Okay, and however they're, they're dealing with, with the situation. We had a situation very much like that. We had a person who um, was going to be discharged from the hospital, a, a quite young person, a 42-year-old woman, and she didn't want to go home. She thought that she was going to be di dying very soon, um, and she didn't want to die in front of her uh, two sons, aged uh, 8 and 10. Uh, she didn't want them to come home in the afternoon someday and find her dead on the floor or whatever. And she really was refusing to go home. Um, and we tried to accept her in that and make other arrangements for her. And with, uh, with the help of other agencies, uh, found a group home where she was able to stay for, for three or four months. And uh, during that time, she kept up contact with her, with her family. And the hospice volunteer made regular visits. and. Uh, after about three or four months, she was ready to go back home, where she still is today. That's one of our success stories. Um, so she didn't die. Oh, no, that's wonderful. You didn't no. tell me the ending I was expecting. I figured you said and she died no. and the son didn't no. see her. No, she's still alive and doing well. Um, and might she live or a little bit longer? Well, oh, yeah, she's definitely living. Uh, see, look at that. We say that might she live. Mm -hmm. But none of us are going to. Um, we really talk when we talk about that. that uh, we all sort of assume we're going to live forever or until such a long, long time down the road. That we're going to be glad that we died because sure, we've lived exactly. so long and <laughs> seen so much. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to that point. But uh, do you find that people are enjoying the living that they are doing while they are dying? Well, certainly that's what hospice tries to promote. And um, it depends upon the person. People, are people very angry that's about that? Oftentimes that's, that's unexpressed. Um, there is usually anger there and uh, uh, the questioning and why me and um, all of those different emotions. You know, people, people typically say, oh yeah, he's in denial or he's in anger. They don't, people go in and out of the phases so quickly and, and um, go through them all that, that it's hard to pigeonhole people at any one point. Um, and again, that's why hospice stresses acceptance, because we recognize that people are going to have a myriad uh, different types of, of emotions and, and feelings and ways of, 
of dealing with that. In your experience, and uh, we talked a little bit about uh, the fact that you are a master, a, a double master, or we talked about with, with Terry before the show, mm -hmm. in... Master's in Clinical Psychology and a Master's in Human Services Administration. Okay, and that, and that, that there's a mouthful that, right that there. That order gets me that a was, cup of coffee. Yeah, that was time consuming, though, isn't it? Got involved with hospice, and, and your dad had terminal illness to mm -hmm. get really involved. Uh, how many years have you mm. been? Since 1978. Since so 1978. Seven, seven years. And that, ladies and gentlemen, in, in that time frame, if there's, is there one case that is more unusual? Was there one person that, that had a more unusual request uh, before death or at the time of death, or who wanted to go to a, a special place or do something special during that time frame? Well, there was um, one of the first cases that I worked with uh, in New Hampshire. Um, a guy named Joe, and he, Joe had um, brain tumors which affected his thinking, and uh, he, he thought that God was giving him special messages. Do you need to break? You're fine. Okay. Um, Feedback, that was just... Um, he wanted to go to the ocean and have clams, and he wanted to go in his Volkswagen bus, which had to have some work done and, and to get it inspected and the whole thing. So we. All of our, all the volunteers got together and helped him get the bus fixed and, and get it inspected, and then we took him down to, down to Hampton, and, uh, and got his clams and uh, fried clams. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's that is an amazing last request. Yeah. Twinkies would be mine. We'll be back <laughs> right after this. <laughs> Twinkies. Isn't that? Oh, we're back. Thank you for the cue. <laughs> it's nice to be back. Three three two five four six six. My guest this evening is Bill Wee from Stratford County Hospice. We laugh, we make a joke. I say I would like Twinkies on the way out. Um, Joe wanted clams, which I'm right. not so sure is such a very same thing either. But uh, the death process is needs to be, don't you think, more incorporated into the living process. Oh, exactly. It takes us by surprise. We don't like it because we have no control over it, but we all know it. Okay for what it brings, um, take time to smell the flowers, uh, take time to tell people that you love them, um, live in the moment, and truly you know, make the most of, of all the time that we do have. And that's what I've, I've really learned from working with, with people who are dying. That right now is all you have, right now. And um, you can do with that what you want to. You can. You can feel badly, or you can, you can feel you can feel good mentally, and and that's that's the important thing. Do we need to get angry though, as well? Well, I does think that, that all depends help? on what your what your belief system is about death. But does arguing with death help? Have you seen people? Uh, there there must be a difference. Some people must say, "Okay, I'm oh, going to die," and they die. Everybody. Some people must really battle. Every you, is every death is different. I believe that people die the way they live. A lot of people um, do, they battle to the very bitter end, and the very bitter end is, is a very apt phrase for, for the, you know, the things that come up from, from inside our bodies with, with, um, uh, in, in some types of death. Other people go very peacefully. Their breathing just becomes more shallow and shallow. Um, other people die in their sleep. Other people have heart attacks. Um, there's a lot of different ways of dying. But I mean that, that person who has an illness that is going to make them sick for a period of time. Do you notice from your experience that those people who are fighters, does that seem to be a better route to follow? Or can we not generalize? Well, I, I guess you know, I would like to think that judgment. you should just fight it out to the end. I, I really am asking for your opinion. Because mm -hmm. you see it from a yeah. different perspective. Well, I, as I said, it, it's all a matter of belief system, as, as what you view death as. If you view death as, as something bad that is, is uh, taking away from you, taking away something from this life, and then you, you're going to fight against it. You want to hold on to what you have here. If you de view death as a transition um, between one thing and another, then you may not fight against it. You may want to go with it. Um, my personal belief is that it's a transition, and so I would rather just go with it. Just go with the flow. Go That's with the flow. interesting. 
See, and I would fight it to the end, still knowing it's inevitable. But Some people do that, and that's okay. This year, the New Hampshire House of Representatives dealt with an issue called the living will. Mm -hmm. um, unusual. Explain that. I can explain that from the legislative term, but... Okay, the living will is a piece of paper that someone would sign which outlines what steps they would want taken in the event that they, would, they no longer are able to make decisions about their own physical person, about their treatment, medical treatment, um, saying that they would not want life uh, extending or heroic measures taken to extend their life if they were not able to make those decisions themselves. The shutting off, I right. in layman's terms, right. the shutting off of those machines. Or even the starting. Or the starting of those machines, okay. The starting of those machines. Right. I just, I want people to know okay. that that's really, that, now that has been a battle nationally mm -hmm. for, for such a long time. How is hospice looking at what happened? Well, I think that we um, support the idea of a living will because it, it goes along with the, with the idea that it is the patient who have, should have control over his or her life and who makes the decisions about what kind of treatment they will or will not receive. And that's basic to hospice philosophy. By saying that, you know, if I cannot make decisions, I do not want uh, life-saving efforts made, fits right in with, with the overall philosophy. I do not consider it to be euthanasia in, in any stretch of the imagination. It, it's not killing somebody. It's letting nature take its course um, in a situation where mankind can no longer do anything to uh, cure the person mm -hmm. or make them better. Mm -hmm. One of the battles that we saw on the House floor was a woman who was a nurse who said, um, sure, you can say that you want to shut down those machines, but I've seen it happen. I was a nurse, and people are on those machines, and they make these miraculous discoveries, uh, recoveries, excuse mm -hmm. me, and they come back, and it's a good thing we didn't shut those machines off. You are looking at this from another perspective. Do you see that happen much? No, no, I really don't. I really haven't. And I think that, especially in, in, in hospice, um, we're dealing with situations that are perhaps a little bit different than those in terms of a person does have a, uh, an illness which in all likelihood is going to cause, cause their death. Um, certainly in, in euthan euthanasia situations, you may have um, cases where it, it's because of a car accident or or something else um, where the person uh, loses consciousness and things are done to them without their knowledge in terms of medical treatment. Um, and then you get to the point where the life-saving measures have been taken. Um, how, when do you, um, you know, pull the plug, whatever. Those are, those are very difficult situations. And um, I think that um, the living will um, would benefit uh, everyone involved in, the, in those kinds of cases. You work on a, you have a volunteer program um, that's quite extensive in its training, mm -hmm. and I, I recall, to mention some more about I recall that, that uh, we had talked about that before. Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit about, if you would, about your funding, and a little bit about how people can either contact you if they have an illness, sure. or contact you if they, they would like mm -hmm. to help others. Um, well, first the funding. <clears throat> We're a United Way agency, United Way of Stratford County, and we derive about half of our funding um, from United Way. The other half comes through memorial donations and um, uh, other civic organizations. We have a phone call, okay. so I'm going to stop sure. here. Oh, and thank you so much for calling. And uh, go right ahead. You're talking to Bill. Thank you for calling. Hello. Hello. Huh. They hung up. They probably thought they got my answer. <laughs> Please call back, and if you don't get us while we're, out, we're on the air, you can call... 692-2825. 692-2825. Yes. Um, if someone wants to help and become a volunteer, I do know they need training, but what mm -hmm. do they, how do they initiate that? Basically by calling that number, and if I'm not there leaving a message on the tape, and I will get back to you, um, we're having an orientation session for our next training program this Thursday night, two nights from now, uh, at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Flanagan Center in Summersworth. And the training will start on April 11th, which is one week from this Thursday. 
uh, it's not a requirement that um, people attend the orientation session, but I do need to talk with them if they miss that but still do want to take the training. So if they could call me at 692-2825. Okay. Thank you. Uh, let me remind you that this gentleman, my special guest this evening, is Bill Reeve, Stratford County Hospice. It's important. It's life and it's death and it's what it's all about. See you next week and Ken Ortman will be here. And we're going to talk about mega things happening with the city of Rochester. I'm Patty Frew. See you next week.